for one more committee member to join, but we're going to go ahead and get started in the interest of time. Um, I will be recording the meeting, so you may all see that on your WebEx, and then we'll give you a quick countdown. You ready? Okay, we'll be going live in three, two, and one. Thank you for joining the RTC's Metropolitan Planning Subcommittee meeting. Chair Johanna Murphy, staff is ready for you to begin. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Chair Johanna Murphy for the record. I'd like to call to order the May 12, 2020 meeting of the RTC Metropolitan Planning Subcommittee. RTC staff will begin with a roll call of the subcommittee members, uh, introduce staff online, and touch on a few housekeeping items. Thank you, Chair Murphy. Marin Dubois, Management Analyst for the, for the RTC, for the record. I will be calling your name in alphabetical order. Please confirm your attendance as I read your name. Mario Bermudez. I'm here. Nas Diallo. I'm here. Alejandra Fazikas. Hey, I'm here. Demetrius Karapanagiotis. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Present. Uh, Jason Love. Present. Johanna Murphy. Here. Richard Seacrest. We have Richard on here. Yeah. I'm Richard, here. are you there? Okay, thanks. Kimberly Sullivan. I'm here. Robert Summerfield. I'm here. And Robert Technipi. I'm here. Thank you. Also, please note that we have several RTC staff on the line for today's meeting. This includes Mr. Craig Rayborn, Director of MPO, Mr. Andrew Kelman, Manager of Transportation Planning, Ms. Ray Lathrop, Manager of Regional Planning, Ms. Michelle Laramie, Senior Regional Planner, Ms. Deb Reardon, Principal Transportation Planner, and Ms. Eileen Pastor, Government Affairs Supervisor, will be reading public comments. We also have Mr. Fred Solis from the City of Las Vegas with us on the line to present on an item. As the Chairwoman mentioned, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. Please state your name for the record before speaking. Voting will be done in an alphabetical roll call style after a motion is made for actionable items. Please wait for your name to be read to provide your vote. The chairwoman will call for any comments or questions after an item has been presented. We ask that you use the mute feature on WebEx and unmute yourself when a vote or comments are called for. Staff will also be monitoring to assist with, the, with muting callers. Thank you, Chair Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Rayburn. Thank you, Chairwoman uh, Murphy and members of the subcommittee. Uh, Craig Rayborn, Director of the Metropolitan Planning Organization, for the record. Uh, first item on the agenda is to conduct your first citizen's participation period. As you know, on March 22nd, 2020, the State of Nevada Executive Department issued Declaration of Emergency Directive 006, which suspended the requirement to have a physical location for public meetings. Pursuant to Directive 006 and for the health and safety of the community, this meeting is being held telephonically. To allow for public participation, the RTC is accepting public comments via email at publiccomments at rtcsnv.com. Comments can be submitted to be read aloud or to be added directly to the written record. Ms. Eileen Pastor, uh, Government Affairs Supervisor, will read the public comments received by the RTC. Thank you. Chairwoman Johanna Murphy for the record. This is the first time set aside for public comment. This time is limited to your comments on items included on this agenda. Comments will be limited to the first 500 words with the remaining words to be included in the written record. Do we have any comments? 
Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Murphy. Eileen Pastor, Government Affairs Supervisor for RTC for the record, and there are no public comments at this time. Okay, thank you very much, Eileen. Uh, moving on, Mr. Rayborn. Thank you, Chair Murphy. Uh, Craig Rayborn for the record. The next item is to approve the consent agenda, which consists of items two and three and may be taken in one motion. Okay. Are there any comments or questions from the subcommittee? Okay. Um, I'm not hearing any comments or questions. Uh, so do we have a motion on the floor? To approve the... Uh, this is Robert Summerfield, motion oh. to approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Robert. We have a motion on the floor. Thank you, Chairwoman. Marin Dubois for the record. Just a reminder that I will be calling your name in alphabetical order. Please call out your vote after I read your name. Mario Bermudez. Approve. Nas Diallo. Approve. Alejandra Fazikas. Approve. Demetrius Carapani Giadis. Approve. Thank you. Jason Love. Approve. Johanna Murphy. Approve. Richard Seacrest. Approve. Kimberly Sullivan. Approved. Robert Summerfield. Approved. And Robert Technipi. Approve. Thank you, Chairwoman. You have all ayes and no nays. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Rayborn? Thank you, Chair Murphy. Again, Craig Rayborn for the record. Uh, the next item is to receive an update on projects included in the fiscal year 2020 and to 2021 Unified Planning Work Program. Mr. An Andrew Kelman, Manager of Transportation Planning for the RTC, will provide an update on this item. Thank you, Craig. Chair Murphy, Andrew Kelman for the record. The Unified Planning Work Program, also known as the UPWP, establishes the MPO's core planning activities and also identifies individual transportation planning studies. Today, I will provide updates on four studies included in the overall UPWP. The first study I want to provide an update on is the Reimagined Boulder Highway Study. This study identifies potential safety improvements for all transportation modes. The plan started during the spring of 2017 and involved the participation of several technical and stakeholder groups. The final study and its recommendations will be presented later this month at the May 21st RTC board meeting for their final acceptance. This will be followed by action of the individual implementing agencies for planning, programming, and engineering of the proposed concept. The final report has been posted and is now available on the RTC website at rtcsnv.com backslash Boulder Highway. The second study I want to highlight is the Southern Nevada Regional Transit Oriented Development Study, or TOD study. This study has not yet been initiated, but it will establish a regional vision and benchmarks for identifying and evaluating transit oriented development locations. These locations will be centered along the high capacity transit corridors identified as part of the onboard mobility plan, which Craig will be providing an update on later in the agenda. The goal of this study is to realign and measure station areas that show high potential for growth and may benefit from additional development or redevelopment focused around high performing transit. This regional project is scheduled to begin later this year and will be completed in about a year and a half. Next slide, please. The next study I wanna provide an update on is the regional walkability plan. This plan will help implement the onboard goal of making short trips easier. And this refers to all short trips, not just those to and from transit stops. The walkability plan will include a vision and policy framework, pedestrian network, 
and identify locations with mode priority given to pedestrians. Context sensitive street typologies and an action plan will both be created. In terms of timing, the RFP for this study has already been issued and the project is expected to begin soon in July of this year. So please expect future updates on the walkability plan at this committee. And finally, the last study I wanna provide an update on is called the Southern Nevada Transportation Impacts on Health Study. This study will provide a baseline estimate of the health-related impacts, costs, and benefits attributed to Southern Nevada's existing regional transportation system. It will also develop and measure the health impacts of future potential scenarios. This study will provide valuable information as transportation plans and projects are developed throughout Southern Nevada. The RFP for this study has been issued and the project is expected to begin later this summer. And that concludes my project updates for these four studies. Thank you, Andrew. Are there any comments or questions from the subcommittee? Okay, I'm not hearing any. So if there are no comments or questions, uh, we will move on to the next item. Mr. Rayborn? Thank you, Chairwoman Murphy. Uh, Craig Rayborn for the record. Uh, the next item on the agenda is to receive an update on the regional work program. Ms. Ray Lathrop, Manager of Regional Planning for the RTC, will provide the update. Ray? Thank you, Craig. Ray Lathrop for the record. Um, approved at the February board meeting, an amendment to the UPWP program included two new tasks related to the regional work program. Uh, regional plan administration and regional planning research. I summarize these two new tasks at the March MPS meeting, as well as we also had um, Paul present an update on one of those tasks, the Citizens Planning Academy. Even though um, everything has changed in reality from the last meeting, our team has continued to work on these tasks and I have several updates that we want to present to you this morning. As a quick reminder, the first new task included everything that we call regional policy plan administration. So that includes um, regional plan core administration. I'll share an example of this next. Uh, regional plan updates, like our opportunity sites that we've shared before. Um, indicator tracking and mapping, like our dashboards uh, maps that we've created. The Community Planning Academy, which we presented in March. Outreach and Communications, which is our ongoing uh, communications and social media strategies, and the annual report, which we uh, share in January every year. Today, we wanted to highlight a project that was completed over a year ago and how we've adapted it to be relevant to today's reality. You may recall that the Southern Nevada Strong Regional Plan received a National APA Award for its community engagement effort. In fact, there was a record of over 70,000 touches to the public to include their ideas and feedback into the planning process. To continue that work, many of the strategies included in the building capacity for implementation theme focus on continuing to increase public participation, especially with communities that have often been left out from the public process or unable to provide input into plans for a variety of reasons. Our team spent time in 2017 and 2018 to compile best practices and lists of resources that anyone in Southern Nevada could continue to deploy high quality community engagement in any public process. We created a community data map that um, showed socioeconomic and demographic data for the whole valley in order to encourage project managers um, to understand the community they were seeking input from and use engagement strategies that were sensitive and contextual to their target audience. Earlier this year, uh, we updated the community data map to be on a new platform and include some additional features. We were able to update the web page when we realized we could also include more digital and virtual resources to assist in light of the current pandemic and we wanted all of our partners to continue their work and still prioritize public engagement. So I'll be showing some screenshots from our website so that you know what we've included. 
This is our landing page for Southern Nevada Strong, um, sns.rtcsnb.com. In the top menu bar, there's resources, and from drop down, the engagement toolkit is listed below. Um, the top of the page clearly defines community engagement and then lists the three tools shown here that we created to be specific to Southern Nevada. The community engagement spectrum, which identifies the types of engagement and participation, and then suggests tactics that are relevant to those. Um, this also now reflects digital tactics depending on the purpose of engagement. The community engagement worksheet is a template and guide to define engagement and its purpose. This is a longer document that can help you scope out and detail the entire engagement strategy. Our recommendation is to think through all the types of engagements, outcomes, and final deliverables that you may want prior to the engagement process. And then that final link is the community data map, which now takes census information and displays them on a map, hopefully easier and more accessible for all users, regardless of your technical expertise. We've updated the section about relevant links to also include resources for online and virtual engagement. The team has read over all of these to understand their purpose and if they really answered the questions we were looking for. We liked these resources that establish the need for planning your meeting, staying engaging um, by asking for polls and other engagement tactics during meetings, and then also those that focus on accessibility and equity. We encourage you all to look at these as we continue to work more virtually than ever before. The second new task found within the regional work program was around research that can guide and inform future implementation of the regional plan. We picked a few topical areas within the plan that were also frequently discussed as priorities for our partners and we identified four research projects for our team to dedicate over the next year. Our hope is to provide updates on these projects regularly and depending on the work, possibly distribute periodic results or products. Since most of these projects will be managed in phases, we hope to have new data to share throughout the next year. And as a reminder, these projects include future housing inventory and needs, extreme heat events and coordinated response, an inventory of regional sustainability planning tools and techniques, and tree canopy social equity impacts. So I'll be sharing some data um, and background for the first three of these today. For the housing study, um, we are looking at established methodology to estimate current and future housing needs for our region. Our team is collecting population and employment forecasts and local zoning and land use plans and data on affordability and production to estimate and identify future housing surpluses or shortages for our region. We hope to identify whether we can expect to see a surplus or a shortage in development in the next few decades. We also want to look at sheer quantity as well as type of housing that we might be looking for. Obviously, uh, whether we have a shortage or a surplus has implications on our region's housing affordability. So identifying a regional supply and demand for housing and housing types will be important. Uh, we're providing technical research for local planning departments if they're interested in adopting additional policies or um, answer some additional questions for their housing elements. Right now, we've pulled a lot of data and are compiling spreadsheets that look at trend lines and other graphs around uh, supply. We're asking for um, some planners about their comprehensive plans to see how calculations within this same issue are calculated locally. And we're looking for demand studies like preference surveys about other issues um, nationally and trends based on population. So at this moment, we're creating something that we hope to be useful to everybody, which is really pulling in a lot of the known data um, around. There's a lot of uncertainty right now as this pandemic continues uh, that might impact some of those inputs. Um, but right now, we hope that we're pulling together some relevant information. It's ongoing and changing. 
For extreme heat, um, Southern Nevada has definitely been identified as one of the fastest warming regions in the country. And recent research has indicated that there's a substantial risk in heat-related deaths from increasing number or duration of extreme heat events. Uh, we want to reduce uh, future adverse effects, effects of these heat events, and we'll need to improve awareness about public health um, and to the general public about how to mitigate or adapt in these conditions. So as a first step, we're working on identifying populations in our region that are most vulnerable to extreme heat, which can be used to inform our regional response and how to target limited resources in areas with concentration of those at greater risk. We're doing so through the development of a regional uh, vulnerability index and map, which are common uh, throughout the country. And we've uh, been looking at a lot of different versions in order to replicate some methodology. Through initial research, and we've also talked to a number of other um, experts across the country, we've identified multiple factors that kind of piece together threats and risks. And we plan on creating an overall vulnerability composite made up of several buckets. Exposure to extreme heat, the ability to adapt, and the capacity to, um, to take care of yourself, and then also the sensitivity uh, to extreme heat, like the existence of exi um, chronic disease or other underlying health concerns. We're hoping to share our findings with planners and those uh, throughout all of the public agencies, including the emergency response departments, to see how this information might inform heat response efforts. And um, next, an inventory of regional sustainability planning tools and techniques. Um, this is uh, pretty timely as it's been a conversation from many of our partners and a little bit um, maybe less disrupted uh, path of research. Um, there's been substantial discussion, of course, in our state about this as well. For this project, we're using um, sustainability plan and climate action plan interchangeably as most of the country has moved um, beyond just talking about sustainability uh, singularly. For this project, oh, sorry. We connected with a number of communities um, in order to learn how they've approached this type of plan. And we're in the midst of drafting a summary document that captures all of the recommendations and suggestions. So first we talked with the sustainability director of the city of Tempe in Arizona, who referred us to other communities that are similar to ours or have had examples that are relevant to our final project. So we've talked to East Central Florida Regional Planning Council, the Triangle uh, Council of Governments in North Carolina, the Western Riverside Council of Governments in California. And we've identified a number of approaches and preparation that goes into sustainability planning. And we look forward to sharing our findings with you soon. As you can see on this slide, we're looking at both the, the process, the foundation, the inputs, and the different components that were included in regional and sustainability planning for those communities. Um, in conclusion, the regional planning team is working hard to both provide the elements of maintenance and ongoing awareness of the regional plan, while also providing technical support, research, and analysis so that those responsible with implementation have the tools that they need to be successful. The Southern Nevada Strong Regional Policy Plan carries a broad vision for the next 20 years and our community is eager to see progress. We hope that this work will assist all organizations and governments with their role. If you need assistance on any of your plans or projects, please reach out and we can also um, figure out how the team can support your work um, even now. So with that, Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Are there any comments or questions from the subcommittee? Okay, um, I'm not hearing any. Um, I did have a, a simple question, Ray, regarding the extreme heat project. Um, what's the, the time frame? Um, completion of that study. 
Yeah, we actually um, have included it in um, the FY21 UPWP as well. So right now we're okay. still um, looking at some phases of it. I will say we've pulled in a number of um, data layers into a GIS platform to start looking at both surface temperature, heat intensity components, while we're also connecting with the School of Public Health at UNLV and have found some researchers also similarly looking at some vulnerability index. We have some, some very preliminary data that we'd be happy to maybe share with you and um, see if you're, if you like the way that it's going. Um, it was a little difficult to do that kind of here in this really formal way because we just have some interesting graphics to show but really not sure how final they are. Right. Um, but um, we'd be happy to talk to anyone offline if you're interested in something more specific for your jurisdiction or if you have some thoughts or ideas to go into that research. Okay, thank you very much, Ray. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, Johanna, this is yes. Craig uh, again for the record. Um, I just wanted to mention too that one of the things that we planned on doing with um, these projects was creating technical advisory groups. Um, okay. However, the timing, you know, we, the, this was ad adopted um, in January and as we started gearing up to kick these projects off is, is almost the exact same time that we started um kind of closing closing down the the public meetings and the group meetings and so on and so we we didn't we didn't form a technical group um for these at at the start of them but we did get the staff and um just some one-on-one -on -one conversations with you know with um knowledge you know experts and, and knowledge leaders um to start putting putting work together but now that we're starting to get into more of a routine and this ability to to interact remotely and and to, we think we're probably at the point where we can probably start up some of those activities and so as we meet with the southern nevada strong steering committee in a couple weeks uh, we'll start talking about how to form those those technical groups so if anyone on, if anyone on the mps is interested in um, kind of participating uh, as a as a stakeholder in any of these studies please let us know um, and we'll we'll work to try to get the to try to get you in, involved in those as they're moving forward. Ah, terrific! Thanks so much, Greg. Okay. Um, if there are no more uh, comments or questions, we can move on to the next item, Mr. Rayburn. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, again, Craig Rayborn, uh, MPO director, uh, and I'm also the project manager for the onboard plan. Um, just waiting for the slide to come up. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so um, we are now in the final stretches of completing the onboard plan. Uh, and so we think there's actually a good chance that today will be the last update to this subcommittee. Um, most of you have been a part of onboard uh, through MPS. Uh, and through other groups or activities as well. And so I, I wanted to just take a brief moment to thank you each for your help and your ideas and your feedback throughout the development of the plan. Um, yeah. uh, next slide, please. So as a reminder, um, the plan consists of eight primary recommendations uh, to improve mobility in general and public transit in particular. Um, they're displayed here uh, and because we've discussed them in the past, I'll, I'll leave them up for a few moments, but I won't go through them uh, in, in detail right now. Um, however, this is a good time to acknowledge, frankly, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on mobility. Uh, as the elements of this plan were being finalized, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic started impacting Southern Nevada, the United States, and, and most of the world. Um, public health concerns, you know, they closed most of the United States and Southern Nevada. Uh, Las Vegas has been one of the hardest hit areas by this uh, public health response. Travel, tourism, conventions, and gaming, you know, which are the largest component of the regional economy, were completely shut down. Uh, and the economic impacts uh, have been and will continue to be severe for a while. 
Um, as an example of some of the transportation impacts, you know, as of yesterday, ridership on the resort corridor uh, is down nearly 100%. Uh, ridership on RTC's residential transit routes is down more than 50% since early March. Um, regional VMT uh, has dropped as much as 53% uh, a few weeks ago. Um, we had one day uh, where VMT was down 37% or was down, I guess that would be 60, uh, 63% um, compared to uh, compared to the period of uh, period of time in January and February. Uh, but it's rebounded um, a bit, uh, but it's still down more than more than 40%. And then um, it's also worth noting, though, that the RTC's bike share program has been seeing massive increases in usage. Um, so it's you know it's it's a valid point that you know some some types of mob mobility are still very important, and as any kind of recovery happens, all the forms of mobility are going to be very important. So um, you know at this moment in time. It's impossible to predict exactly how the recovery will occur or how long it will take, but the recommendations that were developed as part of Onboard to improve mobility for Southern Nevada um, are, are going to be important elements for supporting economic recovery because they'll improve overall mobility and, and help provide more affordable transportation options. So when we start moving towards implementing the recommendations in the plan, part of what we will need to acknowledge and then incorporate into that process will will be, you know, the region's economic recovery needs at that exact point in time. So, with that side note, now I'll um, I'll talk about the final steps of completing the project. So, from January through the end of March, we conducted an online survey to get feedback about the plan's recommendations. The survey allowed users to review the plan, the recommendations, the, the eight recommendations that we just saw. And then they can also look at the more than 60 individual projects that were embedded in those recommendations. And they could rate each of those recommendations on a five-point scale. Um, in, uh, in the end, we received uh, almost 10,500 um, unique or usable responses. So next slide. So this map um, shows the home zip codes for the responses. Uh, the takeaway is that they are spread across the valley. There are obviously high points and lower points, um, but they're spread across the valley. And it's a really good indication that um, along with the large number of responses, 10,000 plus responses, and then the demographic spread that we gathered, um, that the survey itself is, is reasonably representative of Southern Nevada's residents. So I'm not going to try to go through the results in great detail. But the main point I'll draw, you, I'll draw your attention to is in the chart on the right side of this slide. Um, and that is that each of the eight strategies received an overwhelming majority of five-star responses um, from the participants. And then just so everyone knows, all of the recommendations, all eight of the recommendations had an average rating of between 4.3 and 4.5. Uh, so generally, generally broad support. So this slide shows how different demographic groups rated the strategies. Uh, you can see some variations, um, but even here, the lowest rating was still um, 4.1 on that scale of um, up to five. Uh, the group that generally had the lowest ratings were high income or over 100,000 um, 100, uh, individual uh, income per year, uh, and the group that generally had the highest ratings were lower income, under 35,000 a year respondents, and then uh, the low income minority respondents. Um, but again, overall, across all the demographics, all the recommendations received average ratings of 4.1 or higher on that five-point scale. So overall, you know, these results indicate um, broad community support for the onboard recommendations. And um, one little side note that's not shown in these results is that when we started to, um, you know, hear more and learn more about um, the coronavirus in late February, um, early March, um, you know, we kept getting responses um, to the survey, uh, but they didn't really show any change in any significant way. Um, 
there were they actually increased uh, a little bit, but again, it just it wasn't very significant. So there wasn't much of an impact to the the survey, at least at that at that point in time. And remember, the survey ran through the end of March, and we were getting um, responses all through that time. So next slide. So um, conducting that survey was really the last step in getting public feedback about the onboard plan. Um, with these results and uh, feedback from many stakeholders, uh, our last technical advisory group meeting, uh, the RTC team and our consultants have been preparing the final plan document. And we will take that to the RTC board in July. Um, after that, the timing of the next steps will, frankly, it will be decided by the region's economic situation and recovery. Uh, but they will include more outreach uh, so that the, the, the public uh, continues to understand the plan and what it can accomplish. Uh, and then the next steps, obviously, will need to include uh, developing a funding plan to implement the recommendations and in, in onboard. Uh, again, though, you know, due to the impacts of um, the pandemic, um, you know, we just don't know exactly what the, the timing will be. Um, but we will, as we monitor, we're, with all of these activities, uh, all the potential activities in the plan, there, there will be opportunities to work on implementing pieces of onboard um, starting very soon, we think. Um, but, you know, overall, regardless of the timing for implementing the onboard plan, it's important to have these mobility improvements identified now and to have them ready to go as soon as the timing is right and then that the funding is available. So that concludes my update. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that members of the subcommittee might have. Thank you so much, Craig. Are there any comments or questions from the subcommittee? Yeah, this is Mario. I have a question on the survey results. If somebody can go back to that slide. This slide, Mario, or this one? Now, the, the next, next one, I guess, that one. Yeah. I'm curious that you have high income and low income, but no middle income. And then on the other end of that, with the age, you have 29 and under, then 60 and older. You don't have a middle group. We have those data. We just didn't include them in the slide. I mean, there's uh, so many different ways to, to sort of break it up. Um, So, so I yeah, it was, the, so the it was full report the has the full range. report that we're sorry, Mario. Go ahead, please. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry. That the results still fell fell in the same range. Uh, the yeah, range. yeah. The full report will show that. Um, uh, I don't think I can quickly pull it up, but um, yeah. I mean, they they're they're all in the same range. Okay. There's, there's nothing really. There's. I don't think there's any, and I'm. I'm not 100% sure about this, but I don't think there's any way that we could slice and dice um, the numbers to get uh, where we would find a, a, a segment of the population that you know generally didn't have these kind of typical four plus type responses. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question or a comment? Um, I just have a, a simple question, Craig. When uh, do you estimate the full report to be available for us to review? So we will have the full draft uh, if, you know, barring no crazy delays, we'll have the full draft in, uh, I think, the second week of June, and we plan on figuring out some way to circulate uh, to our technical advisory group members. Mm -hmm. um, those who have, from local agencies who've participated in the roadshow things where I've come around with various pieces of the plan, um, we're figuring out some way to, to do that virtually. Um, but once we have the, the full document out, we will probably distribute it to um, MPS members just for, um, you know, for, for a review comment. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, and with that, I'm not hearing any more comments or questions, so we can move on to the next item, Mr. Rayborn. Okay, yeah. Um, so thank you again, Chair Murphy, uh, Craig Rayborn, uh, for the record. Uh, so the RTC is the uh, designated MPO for Southern Nevada, um, has been working with the City of Las Vegas and Kimley Horn to conduct a technical analysis to facilitate Green Street multimodal connectivity along the Bruce Street corridor. Um, the findings of the Bruce Street the Bruce Street Green and Complete Street study include recommendations on complete street elements for pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit users. It also identifies potential safety enhancements at key intersections, analyzes the application of green infrastructure um, within the corridor, as well as proposed connections um, uh, from Bruce Street to the City of North Las Vegas, Cashman Center, Fremont Street, Hollingsworth Elementary School, and the Spencer Greenway Trail. Uh, the study began in May of 2018 and wrapped up in April of 2020. Um, so uh, Fred Solis from the City of Las Vegas uh, is here to provide an update on the study. Mr. Mm -hmm. Solis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Reborn. Um, the item before you is the Bruce Street Green and Complete Street Study Update. Uh, as uh, some background, the study area is a 2.6 mile stretch between Charleston Boulevard to the south and North Las Vegas Boulevard to the north. Um, if you, next slide, slide, please. There you go, thank you. Um, if you're not familiar with this corridor, it's essentially a north-south corridor right in between Maryland Parkway and Eastern Avenue. Um, the corridor is envisioned as a multi-model link downtown North Las Vegas and downtown Vegas. Uh, it does intersect three of our downtown master plan areas, or sorry, uh, uh, so we do see this as an important north-south uh, link, uh, especially as downtown redevelopment moves eastward. As the planned Spencer Greenway Trail is built out, the corridor will provide a vital bicycle and pedestrian connectivity between UNLV, downtown Las Vegas, and downtown North Las Vegas. So if we uh, do in the future ever building out the Greenway Trail. Uh, this will be a nice uh, connection from that trail up to North Las Vegas. Next slide, please. So here's the map of the corridor. Um, the actual Bruce Street corridor is highlighted there in orange. Um, so as you can see, there are six schools in the corridor. Uh, going from north to south, we have the connection obviously up in North Las Vegas. Uh, about midpoint, we have the Cashman Center. Uh, the city seat will city expects to redevelop at some point in the future, uh, so that connection is going to be very important. Moving south, you go through uh, under the viaduct and through Fremont Street, which is an important connection uh, down to Charleston over to the Spencer Greenway Trail. Next slide, please. So the project team did uh, some public outreach. Um, our key efforts were an 11-question bilingual online survey. Had 51 responses to. Uh, we had five stakeholder meetings with the principals of the various schools along the corridor. Uh, we participated in two neighborhood meetings with some neighborhood groups there in the downtown or around that area. Uh, we also participated with into a, we had two pop-ups, uh, one at the Hollingsworth Safe Summer Nights event and one at a Las Vegas soccer game. Um, the project team did have Spanish speakers, so for each outreach event we we were able to communicate for those who did not speak English. Next slide, please. So the key findings from the outreach were 75% um, of respondents were unsatisfied with the existing landscape and shade in the corridor. 62% were unsatisfied with bike facilities. 54% were they felt that the safety improvements such as sidewalks, crosswalks, and street lighting was most needed or the most needed, needed improvements in the corridor. And 68% uh, of the respondents indicated a desire for a park or open space under the uh, US 95I515 viaduct. Next slide, please. So uh, the way the study was organized, the consultant broke down um, the corridor into 10 segments. Uh, so each segment, um, the study for each segment, the study recommends alternatives with both a lower cost retrofit improvement option as well as the higher cost complete street roadway improvement option. So I feel this is very important as far as the study is concerned. Um, you know, we're always competing for CIP dollars. So the fact that we have you know, 
relatively low cost spot improvements such as like sidewalk infill or um, you know flashers that type of improvement that can really benefit the corridor and still keep the cost low while at the same time you know looking forward to that ultimate condition where you have the full uh, complete street you know move the curb line in add trees the whole night next slide please so this is an example of a spot improvement. There was, number, there was a numerous uh, sections of the corridor that were missing sidewalk. So this could be a, a you know, nice, easy, low-cost fix for the city to go in, you know, add some sidewalk at these locations, and it really, really will have a, a significant benefit um, to the uh, pedestrian experience along this corridor. Next slide. So this is another spot improvement example. Um, this is at uh, Gregerson at the center of the blind. Um, the top right photo shows the aerial. Uh, so you have, there's actually two bus stops on either side of the street, of Bruce Street. Uh, so you have that one um, pedestrian crossing. It, it, it's not real easy to get to and from those bus stops, uh, especially considering you have the blind center adjacent to this station. So a spot improvement, again, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a, uh, meant to improve the area, but, but keeping costs low. So in this case, we had flashers, paint additional crosswalks. We did do a curb extension on the uh, on the Gregerson uh, just to make that crossing easier. But this is again another another spot improvement that you know um, lower cost, a lower investment, but it does have a, a great benefit for the corridor. Next slide, please. So here's an example. Obviously, I won't go through all ten segments, but this is an example of one of our segments. Uh, this particular segment is between Charleston and Fremont Street. This is what essentially we did for each, each segment. Um, in this case, we have the, the first would be the existing condition section. Uh, the alternative one would be low cost um, uh, option where we were still working within the curb line. Uh, we reduced some, some lane length width and uh, restripe. We had a buffer. Um, all this, except all this is lower cost, it's all within the curb line. And then finally, we have the complete street alternative, uh, the kind of the higher cost. This is what we aspire to type improvement that hopefully down the line we can implement. But it does require moving in curbs, uh, possible uh, utility relocations, um, and then adding the landscape creation and all that uh, to complete the project. Next slide, please. So in addition to the 10 segments, we also had five focus areas. Uh, we had these focus areas as we felt that these were really important little uh, parts of the, of, the, of the overall corridor. So the five, the five focus areas were Hollingsworth Elementary, uh, the I-15, US-95 open space, um, the uh, Bruce and Maryland intersection, which is a catchment uh, down to the south, the Sprintswood Greenway trail connection, and then the, the connection at Fremont Street. Next slide, please. So this is, an again, we won't go through every single one, but this is kind of an example of what we did for Maryland. Um, this is the existing condition out there, the aerial. Uh, it's kind of a, a really odd intersection, especially if you're traveling by pedestrian or by foot or bike uh, going northward. There's no real easy way to cross the street. It, it's really awkward and cars are going pretty fast and visibility is pretty, pretty low. Um, so we propose the next slide, please. So in this case, it's pretty simple. We'll just do a T intersection at crosswalks, signalized um, adjacent to this. Uh, this uh, area, we have a lot of excess right of way, so we could poss you know, possibly use that right of way for you know, landscaping, public art, right, whatever. But, but it is there that, that's able and it's able to be utilized. Next slide. So here's a one more focus area. This was the, uh, the viaduct open space option under the, uh, the highway. We acknowledge that that NDOT is, is you know, in the, currently in the process of working on or designing their downtown access project. So anything we do, obviously, will have to be will have to come after they complete construction of that project. You know, ten years down the road. Um, but still, we wanted to still explore these options for the public opinion and get it into the study. So this is what it looks like now. As you can see, a lot of a lot of area there. It may or may not be there after the downtown access construction is complete. But this is what it is now. Um, next slide, please. This is kind of like a build out. And you know, just have different amenities for the park, you know, state park, dog park, sports courts. Uh, but we feel that it, it would be a good location, especially for this neighborhood that lack open additional amenities. Be a good place to, uh, to add some of this. Some of these. Next slide. 
So finally, we have our implementation matrix. Again, I feel this is important part of, this, of, of, of the uh, important result or outcome of the study that they provided this with this implementation matrix. So we can quickly and easily just kind of glance at it and um, every improvement for every segment, be it spot or a complete street improvement, uh, they have anticipated costs. So that's, that gives us a, a quick, you know, high level identifier as to uh, the level of investment uh, that the, uh, the city would need to, to, to commit to uh, to do that improvement and also could, you know, sell some of the lower cost, low hanging fruit projects such as the sidewalk infill. Um, that concludes my presentation. If you, the committee has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks so much, Fred. Uh, does anyone on the committee have uh, questions or comments? OK, I'm not hearing any. I, Fred, I do have one question. Mm -hmm. um, in the presentation, you showed us a street section, um, I think, between Fremont and Charleston. And it looked like um, the ultimate build out moved the bicycle facility uh, behind the curb. So my question was just, and I know this was just a snapshot of one segment, is yeah. that the ultimate goal for the entire corridor? No, yeah. no. So e yeah, each each segment is, because the, the characteristics of the of the corridor kind of varies quite a bit. Okay. So th there are some segments that are, are predominantly residential, which we're not really proposing a complete street element to it. It'll just be, uh, you know, some of the sidewalk infill, making a, a more comfortable bike lane buffer, things of those of that nature. Um, but yeah, so, so this is just a, a quick and uh, just one example out of 10, um, which they all okay. kind of vary. And not every single one will have a complete street component to it. OK, OK. So this was uh, then moving that bicycle facility back a curb because it's more of a high traffic area? Yeah, exactly, right. Okay. And, and, okay. and yeah, and, and it's kind of tricking that area as well because we have uh, on-street parking for residents which we don't want to get rid of. So it kind of limits us what we can do. And it's just an alternative. And I figure it's a concept and we kind of figure it out down the road. But, you know, um, we want to get some of those complete street elements into it. Certainly. OK, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, so and I don't think anyone else had any other questions. If so, say now. <laughs> OK, hearing none. Thank you so much, Fred. That was Oh, great. thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, so we can move on to the next item then, Mr. Rayborn. Thank you, Chairwoman Murphy. Uh, the next item is to receive a report about updating the Southern Nevada Strong Downtown North Las Vegas Opportunity Site Plan. The SNS Regional Plan identified four opportunity sites uh, to demonstrate specific locations that are well suited to model the principles of sound urban planning um, Ms. Michelle Laramie, the senior regional planner for the RTC, will report on the downtown North Las Vegas opportunity site. Michelle? Thank you, Craig. Um, and again, Michelle Laramie for the record. So um, at one of the last meetings last year, we shared an overview of our plan to review the Southern Nevada Strong opportunity site. Um, and at that time, we were still just beginning the process with our partners and we were developing our strategy and scope for the project. So we've now worked through a scope and deliverables for each of the opportunity sites um, and are actually nearing completion on the first site, which we reviewed, um, which was downtown North Las Vegas. Um, so just as a quick refresher, the four opportunity sites are Boulder Highway at Gibson Broadbent Intersection, downtown North Las Vegas, um, the Las Vegas Medical District and the Maryland Parkway Corridor. Um, and as Craig mentioned, these were chosen as they were um, ideal locations to catalyze reinvestment and revitalization um, and, and put into practice strategies to support new jobs, housing, and transit options um, for the region, all of which, of course, were goals and priorities identified in the regional plan. Um, so what you previously saw was our proposal to conduct a five-year progress report for each opportunity site. And through this process, our goal is really to capture and communicate what five years of planning and progress looks like in one place, as well as offer some technical assistance around specific issues 
that may have proved challenging for implementation over the last five years since these sites were adopted. Um, so previously, we shared this high-level overview of what the process might look like, um, detailed in the four phases listed here. And we've since completed phase one for all of the opportunity sites, um, which consisted of the various tasks listed here on the slide. Um, and we previously went through those, so I'm not going to um, go into those in any detail. Um, as you know, the goals for each opportunity site are very similar, but each opportunity site does have its own unique set of existing conditions. Uh, so the strategies for redevelopment and revitalization do differ for each one. Um, and because of this, it was important for us to develop a project scope that was flexible enough to take these unique differences into account. Um, but still could provide a similar finished product and some consistency in the final report for each site. Um, so we designed the majority of the process uh, so that it's pretty similar across all of the plans in the four finished products. Uh, but we did allow some room for unique deliverables um, that's highlighted there in the site-specific deliverables section. Um, so over the last five months or so, we've been specifically working with North Las Vegas to review their opportunity site, um, the downtown area. And we're currently in phase four of this process and expect to be finishing up in the next month or so, um, pending on, you know, what kind of realities that, that we're all going to need to deal with in that time. Um, so in the addition, to the standard deliverables listed here. Um, we also worked with North Las Vegas to support their staff with um, some mapping and production of, of materials that could be potentially used for marketing um, or for promoting kind of the, the vision for the area. Uh, we're also working to um, provide new placemaking strategies for potential districts. Um, or potential cultural areas within the downtown footprint, uh, as well as bringing new strategies for overcoming language and communication barriers within the downtown community. Um, and a lot of these ideas, as you'll see, um, kind of take shape through some case study research that's provided in the final report. Um, so, as I mentioned, we're in the process of finalizing the five-year progress report for North Las Vegas. Um, and just a quick review of what, um, what the report consists of. So we do have a literature review um, that focuses on the past planning efforts, programs, and policies, as well as an existing conditions analysis um, to kind of capture anything that might have changed over the last five years. Uh, we also held several stakeholder interviews. Um, we researched past events and met regularly with the City of North Las Vegas staff in order to um, just try to get a, a, a real in-depth understanding of everything that may have contributed to the progress of the Opportunity Site over the past five years. Um, and ultimately, these findings then informed our final report um, and are reflected throughout the text that um, that'll be in that report. So as, as far as the next steps go, we're working with North Las Vegas um, to share the report now with multiple city stakeholders um, who will review and provide comment. Um, and over the next month to six weeks, we'll work to incorporate these comments into the final published report. Um, and once the report is finalized, we'll be updating the Opportunity Sites portion of our website um, in order to reflect this most recent um, so quickly, I'm just going to detail a couple of the sections that are provided in, in this um, five-year progress report. So the first section of the report provides an overview of the community's vision for downtown North Las Vegas and summarizes some of the various visionary components um, of past planning efforts that were found in the literature review. Um, so in this in this phase of the project, we worked with North Las Vegas to create a preliminary vision deck for downtown, um, which can ultimately be used to inform some of the final marketing and promotional delivery uh, deliverables, excuse me, for the site. Um, and early on in the process, 
North Las Vegas also expressed an interest in identifying possible districts within their downtown area. Um, so after completing the literature review, we saw some specific ideas and strategies that consistently appeared in many of the downtown planning studies that could start to inform specific districts for the downtown area. Um, so we put together this preliminary map and we're now working with the city of North Las Vegas staff to finalize this map. Um, it's since actually been put into GIS um, and included in the final report. Um, and so once that is finalized, we'll be able to hand the GIS uh, file over to the city staff so they can incorporate um, the proposed districts or um, information that, that ends up being relevant into their future planning efforts. Um, so the progress section of the final report provides an updated assessment of downtown North Las Vegas' strengths and challenges. Um, we highlight the accomplishments and milestones that have been achieved in the last five years, as well as some of the obstacles and barriers that still persist in the downtown area. Um, so the bulk of this section documents our evaluation of the progress that has been made um, on each of the specific implementation strategies um, that were adopted in that original 2015 report. Um, so overall, there were five primary actions um, which were list is, are listed here on the slide. And each action had a handful of strategies that um, were recommended for achieving the primary action. Um, and those strategies are included in the sample page um, of the, of the report, They're, they did come out a little small. I apologize about that. Um, but we've evaluated each strategy using a scale um, of complete, on track, not started, or no longer relevant. And most of these classifications are pretty obvious, I think. Um, but just to clarify, no longer relevant was given to strategies um, that may have been explored previously but they weren't really found to be feasible um, for implementation, or they may be considered outdated at this time. Um, but no longer relevant it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that these are off the table. It just means that the strategy isn't currently being pursued, um, but it could be, again, if current conditions change. Um, and so we also summarized our findings for each action in the text that you see on the sample report page. Um, really detailing the research that led to our evaluation for each of the strategies. In the recommendations section here, we provided an updated action and strategy framework for continuing work on the Opportunity Site. Um, so overall, things are very similar to the previous strategies. The five primary actions remain the same, um, but we have added one new action, which is to coordinate plan and um, and this action looks to create more formal coordination around everything that is happening in downtown North Las Vegas. Uh, it's our recommendation that all of the various city departments that are working in this area, um, such as economic development, planning, public works, neighborhood services, um, begin to meet on a more regular and recurring basis to discuss their work and review opportunities for cross-department collaboration. Uh, of course, there is already much of this going on, um, but currently it's, it's somewhat kind of project-based and a bit ad hoc. Um, and we've seen that ongoing um, coordination kind of in, the, in a formal committee type fashion for priority areas have had huge benefits for other priority planning areas such as, um, for example, the Las Vegas Medical District. And so we believe some more formal um, and consistent coordination could help bring about new opportunities for North Las Vegas as well. Um, so additionally, the strategies for each priority action um, have been updated as shown in the tables um, from the sample report page here. And the important thing to know is that we provided also some, um, some new recommendations and ideas for projects progress the 2020 updated strategies, um, such as uh, UPWP projects or specific programs and policies and ideas, and those are detailed in that far um, right column. 
So lastly, as I mentioned, we also provided some case study research around some of the challenges that continue to remain in downtown North Las Vegas. Um, and this slide just shows a few quick photos of some of the case studies um, that, that we included. Um, so one was for Mill Creek Linear Park in Bakersfield, California, um, which was kind of a catalytic project that sparked revitalization in downtown Bakersfield. Um, the Linear Park helped create active transportation infrastructure, connects users to various locations in downtown Bakersfield, and also incorporated public art into the park, um, which really kind of helped bring about a unique identity to downtown Bakersfield. Um, the Neighborhood Partner Fund grant through the City of Las Vegas has contributed heavily to neighborhood revitalization for some of the city's downtown neighborhoods. Um, and really has helped support some of the grassroots community improvement projects that happen in that area. Um, additionally, the Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, has partnered with the city and local financial institutions to invest in housing rehabilitation in neighborhoods that surround their hospital facilities. Um, and they've created many programs that contribute to um, stable and affordable housing and improved neighborhoods. Um, and lastly, the Art Walk in Des Moines uh, has helped connect residents, I'm sorry, residents and visitors in downtown Des Moines to 87 pieces of public art through visible crosswalks and wayfinding. Um, and this project specifically targeted six intersections with high traffic volume um, for their, their art interventions. Um, so it really has a high um, high level for improving pedestrian safety in downtown Des Moines as well. Um, so there's several other case studies that are provided in the final report um, chosen to showcase uh, certain projects, programs, and policies um, that are helping other communities who are tackling similar goals and challenges in their downtown areas um, and, and finding success that downtown North Las Vegas can um, take into consideration um, in their work as well. So that um, pretty much sums up our work in North Las Vegas um, and our proposed plan for reviewing the remaining three opportunity sites. Um, so I'll just end here and open it up for your thoughts and your feedback, and um, we would love to incorporate any of your comments as we move forward with um, the remaining project. Thank you, Michelle. Um, are there any comments or questions from the subcommittee? Okay, hearing none. Um, I would just like to take this opportunity to uh, thank Michelle and everyone else over at uh, Regional Planning at the RTC for working with us on this project. Um, I think this is going to be an extremely helpful report. It helped us uh, consolidate all of the improvements that have been made thus far. And I think updating those recommendations will help us continue the momentum that we've had over the past five years. and ensure more improvements are are made and um, public improvements are are definitely incorporated into this area as well so thanks so much for your hard work michelle thank you it's been a real fun project great okay if there are no more uh comments or questions we can move on to the next item mr rayborn thank you murphy uh Greg rayborn for the record uh, the next item is to receive a presentation and uh, potentially provide input on the Southern Nevada Coordinated Public Transit Human Services Transportation Plan update. Uh, Ms. Deborah Reardon, Principal Transportation Planner for the RTC, will present the plan to the subcommittee. Deb? Great, thanks so much, Craig. And this is Deb Reardon for the record. So today I'll provide a short update on the coordinated plan. Um, so first, just a quick overview of this plan's purpose. Next slide, thank you. So the primary goal of the coordinated plan is to preserve and enhance mobility for seniors, people with disabilities, and also low-income populations. So this plan meets requirements for a few key federal but equally of equal importance is really providing a forum for coordination among Clark County's urban and rural 
tra transportation providers. Um, and so including public, private, and nonprofits within that group. Um, so our coordination has included MPS organizations like Clark County School District and um, Clark County Social Services. Um, so, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, this slide is great, thanks. So, so our planning began back in August of 2019 through community engagement throughout all of these steps. Um, so first we looked at existing conditions and gap analysis by reviewing past plans, um, and then also input through roundtables, presentations and partner meetings, and also coordination and engagement through a stakeholder advisory committee. And then that information fed into the development of our goals and strategies and action plan with just a couple highlights of existing needs. Um, so during outreach, we consistently heard that transportation demands were really outpacing the services available. And this led to things like lead times to book trips, people not making it to work or medical appointments in a timely manner. And providers were also challenged with a growth in population and overall aging population, and also a significant portion of our population living below Poverty. The pandemic and increasing unemployment will also contribute to these challenges. So we are continuing to identify um, additional challenges during the planning process. We, um, the group identified a few that you see here on this slide. So our built environment is, creates a difficult place for people walking or using mobility devices that transit trips sometimes take too long. Um, shared demands, shared demand response on services are sometimes limited by eligibility criteria, application processes, or capacity, that there are funding shortfalls, and lastly, that there is limited access to social services as shown in the next map. So this is the transit accessibility gap analysis um, completed by the project consultant, Nelson Nygaard, um, and it identifies a couple of key gaps in West, and then also some portions of Henderson and Boulder City. Um, so after analysis of lots of maps like this, um, the group envisioned a new future for mobility for these populations, the following goals. So the goals that the group came up with include expanding mobility options, so expanding the capacity of our existing services. Um, our inventory includes over 100 providers. Um, and really expanding those and building capacity to serve populations of all abilities and also means across the valley and in rural areas as well. Um, secondly, increasing awareness of transportation. So regularly educating and informing residents and visitors of all of the options available through user-friendly and also accessible educational tools. Third, leveraging technology. So exploring use of new mobility options existing transportation services. Fourth, improving connections to transit, um, both in looking at optimizing land use, transit, bicycle and pedestrian facilities, and then also increasing the efficiency and safety and accessibility of those first and last mile trips. And then lastly, expanding on regional collaboration efforts across all of the nonprofit as well as government agencies. So for from the group identified 15 priority strategies. Um, next slide, please. And I'll just share a couple of those today. So first, the, um, the concept of a mobile travel training program. Um, in this strategy, transportation providers would travel to different sites like senior centers, medical centers, and they would offer hands-on travel training and also share resources on how to access services, what those eligibility requirements are, certification really take that information on the road to where people need it. Secondly, um, the concept of neighborhood social service centers. Um, this was identified previously in Southern Nevada Strong, um, where co-locating service at the neighborhood level, regional level, can really have an impact on reducing travel time and cost for all street on our transportation network and service providers. Um, the group also identified potentially accomplishments through pops. Um, third, the mic was microtransit 
other services, such as expanding Silver Star routes and expanding food service delivery through this low-income communities. Fourth, um, expanding technology for universal transit navigation. There are new tools out there like smart canes, um, also remote navigation support um, that would be able to potentially support um, wayfinding for individuals. And then lastly, building out um, a more accessible network of paths of travel. So both in mapping our side not sidewalk network and then establishing methods and for reporting areas where either bus stops or sidewalks may not meet accessibility standards. So these strategies are really flexible and subject to change based on all of the um, organization's available resources and needs. Full plan also includes a, a more strategies if you're interested in learning more. So next slide. So this is just a quick recap. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we can stick with this one. Um, so stakeholder engagement, um, this is just a quick recap of what we've done so far. One-on-one -on -one meetings, as I mentioned, stakeholder advisory committee meetings, roundtables. We've engaged, I need to do a new recount, but the last time I checked was over 300. Um, and so we're also holding a community stakeholder meeting on May 19th and then doing a 21-day public comment period that started just yesterday um, on May 11th that will continue through the end of this month. Um, we're also taking the full draft plan to this month's um, Transportation Access Advisory Committee and Executive Advisory meetings, um, and those will be combined with um, public information meeting. Excuse. So our timeline. Um, so we're here in the public period review. Um, then we'll be taking all the comments for a final draft, moving towards our TC board adoption or review in July. Next slide. Um, um, our website backslash CTP for coordinated transportation plan. Um, if I encourage you all to um, go to the website, check out the full draft, um, and happy to um, receive any comments. Next slide. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to. I think we have a little time for discussion and questions. So if you have any questions or comments, we're happy to address those now. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, does anyone on, on the subcommittee have any comments or questions? Okay. Um, I'm not hearing any. Um, so thank you so much, Deb. I really appreciate all of the information you provided today. Um, and uh, with that, um, if there are no more uh, comments or questions, we can move on to the next item. Mr. Rayborn? Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Murphy. Craig Rayborn for the record. Uh, our next item is to receive regional staff updates. Uh, this is an opportunity for the subcommittee members to share updates or information with other members. Ah, thank you. Is there anything that a member of the subcommittee would like to share with the group? Madam Chair, uh, Craig yes. Rayburn, if, if I may. Yes. Um, you know, I, first, I just want to thank everyone for participating today. Um, you know, although there was uh, a, a pause for a couple of months in, in some, and certainly not all, as you've heard today, uh, of the public-facing activities that we, the MPO, have been undertaking uh, before the recent events, uh, you know, the MPO team has been plugging away at a really wide range of activities. And it was really important, I thought, that we still keep this group, you know, you're our stakeholders, uh, updated and then provide opportunities for you to to provide any feedback or comments. And so this meeting was was really important um, uh, for me to be able to facilitate that happening. 
Um, another thing that I just wanted to say is that, uh, you know, we know that these are kind of some challenging times, um, probably for your agencies, as well as for your coworkers and colleagues and departments and teams. So I just want to remind everyone that uh, the MPO team, um, you know, both the transportation and the regional planning teams are, are here to support you in any way that we can. Um, you know, of course, we're we're guided by our adopted work program, but we also know that, you know, we can possibly be a resource for you as we're all moving forward with continuing to try to advance good plan, good and sound planning. Um, so if there's something that we can, we can do to help you and therefore, you know, help planning activities uh, continue and be strong for the region, uh, we're going to exercise all the flexibility that we can to try to provide that assistance. So, I just want everyone to know, please feel free to, um, to ask if you need something. Um, it can be small um, or big. I mean, we, yesterday we helped set up a WebEx meeting um, just to accelerate that process and make it a little smoother and easier. And so anything you know, small like that or, or bigger, if there's something you need, um, please feel free to, uh, to ask us um, uh, if you need something, okay? So that was all I had, thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, does anyone else on the committee have an uh, update? Okay, I'm not hearing none, but uh, from North Las Vegas, I would like to update uh, that we started a uh, wayfinding, developing a wayfinding program with support from the Southern Nevada Health District and the CDC through the uh, CDC's REACH program. Um, the intent of our wayfinding program is um, to incorporate wayfinding signage throughout uh, North Las Vegas to help um, encourage our residents to um, sometimes, if they can, opt for active forms of transportation. We're focusing the wayfinding program on identifying 10-minute uh, walks, uh, and so we're hoping that will encourage more use of that system. And also within the program, while the program is going to be um, citywide, we will be actually producing and installing wayfinding signage in our downtown area, highlighting 10-minute uh, walks from the neighborhood to all of the uh, recreational opportunities, the little parks and community centers throughout our downtown area. Um, we are about halfway through this project. We, um, oh yes, and we'll also be updating our comprehensive master plan with new policies promoting the incorporation of wayfinding signage in future projects as well. So uh, we're developing the policies for our comp plan, the overall wayfinding program with uh, recommendations on where to sign and how to sign, and then um, installing signs in our downtown area and we will have all of those three items completed uh, by uh, September and uh, so far we've been able to uh, keep this project rolling um, even with our our social distancing so um, just wanted to let everybody know the status of that project okay and uh, with that I'm not hearing um, any other comments from the other members? So um, we will move on to what I believe is our, our final item uh, on the agenda um, for citizens' participation. Mr. Rayborn? Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Murphy. Uh, the last item on the agenda is your final citizens' participation. Uh, this is the second uh, time set aside for public comment. Just a reminder that the comments will be limited to the first 500 words uh, with any remaining words included into the written record. Do we have any public comments? Thank you, Chairwoman Murphy. Again, Eileen Pastor, RTC Government Fair Supervisor for the record, and there are no additional public comments at this time. Okay. Thank you. And if there are no additional comments, 
Um, I will close the item. I want to take this time to also thank everybody for their participation today and for the RTC and their staff for organizing this meeting. Uh, we've had some wonderful presentations today, very informative. And if there's nothing else, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. The recording is